Maybe to start off, uh, I guess, how did you transition into teaching after after your baseball days? Okay, yeah. So um, I went to High Point University uh, out of high school and uh, majored in physical education and uh, planned on doing that. And, and uh, the idea was, since the time I was about eighth grade, that I would uh, that I'd play professional baseball for thirty years or whatever, <laughs> and uh, and then retire and teach for fun and uh, and almost do it as a volunteer thing. I just always had wanted to do it. I had a really good mentor, my eighth grade teacher, and um, and a few others along the way too. So when I when I uh, finished at High Point and I uh, was signed by the Jays, it had always been a, a, an idea to go back. So once I I kind of there's an interesting story behind it, I guess, but I kind of like retired slash released. Um, I was waiting on an age, my agent, who had been a friend of mine, and I was trying to tell him that I was done. And I happened to get a phone call as I was waiting to tell him because I went to my agent first. And uh, and so the Jays called and said, "Listen, we don't have space for you." And I was like, "Well, it's good because I was about to call you and tell you I wasn't coming back." So <laughs> it's perfect. So. Um, so it ended up being, a, I think, a pretty good phone call for them because I'm sure every phone call that they make like that is um, is probably the worst phone call that most guys get. And sure. uh, and I was like, I just want to thank you for an opportunity, and it was fun. And uh, and I kind of, you know, I saw the writing on the wall a little bit too, and so um, so thank you. And he's like, uh, okay, yeah, you're welcome. So uh, so I got into teaching, um, taught PE just for about half a year. And then uh, actually the teacher at the school um, who taught science, she uh, her son committed suicide, which was uh, awful. And so my principal was stuck with uh, physics, biology, and chemistry to figure out. And uh, and so she looked at all the resumes, and having a PE degree, you're fairly close to a science degree. You take a lot of science classes. So, um, so she said, what do you think about covering this for just a week? And then let me see what I can do, because I just don't want somebody I can get the female teacher to cover your classes. And so I tried it and, um, and just to help out and loved it. So then when my wife and I were looking to move from Tampa to Orlando, um, there's a science position open at the school I teach at now, Master's Academy, and a uh, middle school science. I never in a million years, like I thought I'd teach PE, coach baseball and basketball, and, uh, and just kind of God had orchestrated it differently that I would do this. And now this past year, um, I just made a shift. They asked me to step into a different role, and so I'm kind of like a like a youth pastorish kind of role. Um, we call it student ministry associate, where I teach half the time Bible classes, and the other half um, do things like chapels and uh, student ministry outreach and things like that. So it's um, it's amazing that it's always what it's not what I ever thought I would do, um, but it's better. And you look back at the track of your life. I look at my time in Vancouver and anywhere else, and can see how they're really being prepared for through those experiences, which are fun, and you have these dreams that you're reaching for, um, but it, it ends up that it, it's a different path that it's taking you down anyway, um, but they're all necessary steps, and so, um, so yeah, just nothing but good memories of it. Okay, well, fair enough. That's, uh, yeah, it's amazing how our life can take it, I guess. Um, I guess, uh, I, I guess maybe let's just start with... Um, um, okay, you're from Guelph uh, originally, and I, I did I did live there for a little bit, so I'm pretty familiar with Guelph, and because uh, uh, I just moved from Ontario myself. But uh, uh, maybe okay. just talk about how your baseball career uh, got started. I, I know you spent time with the Barry Baycats, had a really good year, and you uh, got to know Paul Spoljarek pretty well. But I guess talk about your baseball beginnings. Okay, so um, so I grew up. Uh, in Guelph a little bit uh, until I was like four or five and then before I started school we moved to Vaughn um, just a few minutes away from uh, Canada's Wonderland there and my dad's a dairy farmer and so whenever my dad would go his, his work shift was basically he would get up at 4.30 and uh, do chores and milk cows and come home for breakfast and then go back down to the barn for the morning and come back at lunch and then about 2 o'clock he'd head back to the barn again until 6 so in the afternoon uh, he made me out of some um, piping for milk pipes and uh, some other stuff that was kind of around, I think, a big piece of wood and whatever. He made me a tee. And he'd played baseball. Uh, they didn't have hardball then. Before the Jays were really around, most of Ontario really played fast pitch. And so it was a windmill. And my dad had played that and his brothers had played that. Um, but he never played baseball, actually, and um, but just loved it and sports family. So I, he would leave about 2 o'clock in the afternoon to go down to the barn, 
and, it, and we lived on the same, like it was, you know, quarter mile walk or whatever. And, uh, and so he'd go, you know, all right, have a good afternoon. I'll see you when I get back. And I would just sit up with this dog named Maddie and I'd put the ball in the tee. And there's a little wooden blue bat and paint all chipped off it. And I'd hit the ball and she, I mean, for hours, like four hours at a time, she would just play on the tee with me. And, and my dad still attributes it. And I do too. Like the fact that I was ever good as a kid probably has more to do with that dog <laughs> than about anything else. So, um, so played T-ball and all that kind of stuff around the Bolton um, area, Bolton, Ontario. And then um, when I was 15, or 14, sorry, uh, Team Ontario, an elite program uh, at the time, I had some tryouts and I ended up making that team. And really most of my, like, like my, we played Sandlot baseball kind of. We, um, Bolton was a small town that played in the double AA, A, triple A loop. So we played a lot of big towns and would beat them. And, uh, but because my dad would drop us, like, I mean, just farm mentality, right? He would, he would drop us off at a baseball field, um, after lunch when I grew up. So it's kind of, a, it's replaced the dog, I guess. And, uh, he would just drop us off with all the equipment and like 10 of us kids would just go to the field and we would just play sandlot baseball. And I really think that that made me a different player. Um, because you got to try things, not playing this organized kind of baseball that everyone plays now. And it's not negative, but I just mean, the baseball IQ stuff, you learn by messing that up. You learn by trying to steal a boost when you shouldn't have. You learn by uh, trying to do something where it doesn't really matter at the time. So who cares? Nobody's keeping stats when you're just all playing all afternoon. And uh, so we were so tight-knit and such a different group of kids um, to play that way that all these kids from a bigger area, I mean, we would beat them because we were really a team. And so, um, so that was a huge benefit. And then uh, Team Ontario was where I really learned – Fundamentals. I remember the, Mark Picard was the coach, and when I was 14, we went to Tennessee on the first big trip. And uh, he pulled me aside after the first game. And he was like the organizational head. He wasn't my direct coach. And he said, hey, what's your name? And I told him, and he says, come here for a second. He goes, you, you, you might be good, but you throw like a goof. He's like, well, why don't you know how to throw an actual baseball? <laughs> and so, because we never did techniques, you know, we didn't do that kind of stuff. We didn't watch videos. We didn't do training sessions. So we just played. And, uh, and so I could throw hard and I was always a better kid around, but, um, but my fundamentals were pretty sloppy. And, uh, and so he cleaned it up and Dan Thompson, um, he co he coached for the Terriers. I'm not sure what he, if he's coaching now with the team as well, but, uh, he's a guy in Ontario who's like a legend in Ontario baseball and, uh, just so committed to kids and developing them. So the team Ontario program really groomed me. I got an opportunity to play with team Canada before, uh, in the junior team as well and then um and then through high point and then again like you said the Barry Bay Cats um I went on draft in my senior year and was pretty bummed about it really and uh and hit a pretty low spot about baseball like just you know and and going to Barry was the absolute best thing at that time because I I kind of had lost the love of the game that you think about a kid growing up playing with his dog and, and playing sandlot baseball with his friends, like that's the one, that's the reason why we did it. And, uh, and Barry was so fun. And you had these guys like Paul Spolgerich and Todd Betts and a few other guys who had been I mean, either long-term minor league guys or major league guys or college guys, but they all work now and they just play because they loved it. And so a high caliber baseball, but just fun. I mean, Angus Roy, the, the coach manager, just fun. And, and I really, I mean, that's why I did so well in Barry is I just, I, I couldn't wait to get to the ball field again. And, and it really, I loved High Point University, but, but there's just that mentality. I think that you got to be careful and it'd be nice to, to teach kids now that like you got into this because it was a game and don't professionalize it too much. And, uh, and so that's, Kind of how I ended up getting all the way to there, and then um, and then again I went undrafted and no call, and I went back and student taught, and then uh, I guess Paul Spolgerich talked to Rob Ducey, and uh, Ducey called somebody else, and I don't know who ever called me. I forget who actually called, but they invited me to a tryout in Florida, and then um, they didn't sign me, and so I was finishing my student teaching. I was coming back to Ontario. I was going to teach, and. Um, and I called the Jays. Like they, they didn't call me back, and I called them, which I know you're not really supposed to do. But, uh, and I said, "Listen, I, I got to apply for a teaching license, and that's the money that I really would rather not spend. If this is a yes, so so do you have an answer?" And they were like, "Well, 
Uh, we don't really have a spot for you right now, but uh, if I can get a couple other guys to see you, um, maybe maybe it might be a yes. And uh, let's let's talk when you get back to Ontario. So um, when I came home, I started working and just kind of leaving this delay time of like hopefully there's a yes. So working at a gym and um, then they called me and told me to come down to the Rogers Center and I hit in front of a couple guys, um, big some big name guys that I didn't even realize at the time. And then um, at, on the way home, uh, I was just happy that I got the opportunity. And then about a couple of days later, they called and said, yeah, we'd like to sign you. And I got to meet Paul Beeston and sign my contract with him. And I have a picture of signing my contract with Paul Beeston, which is a kid growing up around the Jays and, and you knowing who, like, I mean, you don't really know that of an organization usually, but to know Paul Beeston from when you're like seven or eight years old. Yeah. Because of the Jays winning the World Series. I mean, it was just such a huge moment. And, uh, like my grandmother, like to know, like she's like, wow, Paul Beeston. Like, so it just, it was surreal. And, uh, so that's how I ended up getting into it. Uh, it's a long story there, but um, hopefully it's some good stuff in there. Yeah, no, lots of good stuff. Um, yeah, so you got to work out the, at the Rogers Center. What was that like? You know, I, I, that had to have been a dream come true right there, just to actually go work out where the Jays play. Yeah, it was. I um, So in high school, for the Premise Cup, um, the high school like championship, usually you play at the Rogers Center. Well, I had a shoulder surgery my senior year and miss an opportunity in that. And then I played in the Rogers Center one time with Team Ontario. Okay. And so to drive in and, like, pull into the parking lot, though, for this, like, because that was fun. But this was, like, I, I'm, I drove down the uh, the 427 and got on the uh, 401 QEW and pulled in. And I remember pulling off to the side, and I just, I pulled the car over, and I started praying. And I was like, Lord, like, I don't, I, I've never been so excited for something in my life. But for the first time in my life, if you don't want this for me, then I don't want it either. And if you want it for me, then then I totally want this. And uh, and I just kind of gave it up. And so I we, we I pulled in and see, and to have like yeah like a will call parking spot underneath the Rogers Center was such a cool thing. <laughs> like you just felt like a star. And, uh, and so I walk in and and they take me under on the tunnel where there's a batting cage underneath. And so you're in like the guts of the Rogers Center and you just like get this backstage pass kind of feel. But again, like, I, I just had felt this freedom of, for the first time, it wasn't a stretch, like, because of my time with Barry and because of just letting it go, um, I was like, I just, I'm just going to enjoy this moment and have fun. And I had a really good couple of rounds of BP just because I was so loose. And uh, so, it, yeah, it was, uh, it, it just, it felt surreal. Um, but it was also just a really cool experience. And it was also cool to be, you know, like a 22 year old guy and, and not be, I mean, being 34 now, um, I'm not by any means like this older guy looking back and wise, Island, but even at 22 compared to 18, like just to have a little bit more under your belt and, and behind you to, to be able to appreciate it and not be so, so starstruck, starstruck that you're not taking it in and just enjoying it for what it is. And, uh, and so, yeah, it's, it's a, it was a big moment. Okay. Okay, so you you sign on the dotted line with the Blue Jays, and you get your first pro experience with the uh, Auburn Double Days, um, and did pretty well in your first season. Uh, you had ten games there, and pretty decent numbers. Uh, certainly hit for some power, four home runs in ten games. Uh, what was your rookie season like uh, in the pros? Yeah, um, it was. So I reported directly to extended spring training. And um, didn't know that that was a bad thing, really, until you got in there with a bunch of guys who didn't make the cut to the long uh, season teams, full season team. But um, I loved Auburn. Uh, I think the the home home runs there. I think it was four of my first five games, or four of my first four games. I mean, I just felt good. A lot of that's attributed to uh, we had a hitting coach, Charlie Poe. Uh, he was this just like bubbly, like fun guy He's from uh, L.A. Uh, he just, he would sing during batting practice. I remember like, if you, if you got one good, he'd go, mm, lean on me. And he just start singing in the middle of it. Or you get jam, he starts singing jam. And just fun. Like, and again, like, it's just that recurring theme of this is a game. Like, like, yeah, it's serious. And yeah, we have a lot of things riding on this and we all want to make it to whatever level. But, um, but it was really disappointing that, that I broke my foot 10 games in. Um, kind of just a weird way and uh that really i mean if you if you want to look at it from just a, a baseball perspective from a from a development perspective i think really that was 
um, that combined with the next year just kind of sealed the deal where um, I was facing a lot to come back against and uh, was kind of at a point of being written off almost. Um, just an older guy already. I was like 24 or 25 when I got to Vancouver uh, a couple of years later. So really just got an organizational guy at that point um, where that first year, I mean, when you hit that well in the first couple of games and show some promise, I mean, you, you find a way to work yourself in. And, uh, and yeah, it was it's really, it sucked to break my foot 10 games in. So what happened was I was on second base and uh, a guy missed a sign and put a bunt down. And so it's just kind of a weird moment. But I, but um, when I stepped to slide to third base, it was first and second, it was a forced play. And I stepped to slide with my right foot and I broke my fifth metatarsal. And the ball got thrown away and I limped across the plate and never stopped, went right back in sat on the bench, like, didn't stop moving, and uh, I went to the trainer, I was like, it's broken, I'm done, get it, take me out, like, I know it's broke, and uh, x-rays confirmed it, and then I spent the rest of the season at home, and uh, and so Auburn was fun, the, the town was fun, it was exactly what you think of when you think minor league baseball, um, just this small town that just waits for their team to get there, and uh, you travel on the bus to these other little towns all around New York and Pennsylvania, Um a group of guys. Dennis Holmberg was my manager. He's just this quirky, hilarious guy. Perfect guy for getting guys coming in. Um, Sipo is a hitting coach there. Just, just again, like it, it was, it was a dream come true. It was a baseball felt like it was supposed to be like. So I really enjoyed it um, a lot. Okay. Um, you had um, a couple of years in, in Auburn. You also spent a bit of time in Lansing and, uh, you know, obviously the biggest ballpark that you got to play in in the, in the Jays system. And you had one home run there. Uh, anything you remember about your uh, time in Lansing? Yeah. So uh, the second year, I actually had a back surgery um, the first day of actual spring training. So I broke my foot. I reported early. Uh, to try to get ahead of the game on some stuff, and I felt something weird in my hamstring. And I thought I had pulled it, and here it was a nerve um, problem that was stemming from a disc herniation. So I had a back surgery the first day of normal spring training, and I was healthy to play again by extended spring. And uh, and that really was tough. Um, I've and even now, like I, my body never was really right again. Um, it took forever to get loose. It, it would get tight on bus rides, which is awful in the minor leagues. So when when I got back up to Auburn, I played another 10 games there, and they moved me to Lansing really because a guy had come up that they had just signed that they needed a roster spot in Auburn for. So I was really, it, it wasn't really that I was promoted. It was more that I was moved out of somebody else's way. And when I got to Lansing, I think I played in a game or two, and then uh, I was put on the Phantom DL, which uh, is where you're not actually hurt, but they don't have a roster spot for you, so they rotate a guy around it. And so then I got back on for three games, and then went back underneath, and I was on it for, I think, 40 straight days. And so you show up every day to the field knowing that you're not going to be able to get in the lineup. And that was, uh, that was a tough challenge, and that really uh, tested me as far as perseverance goes. Like, what kind of attitude will you have? When, um, when you know you can't get in the lineup, what kind of teammate are you to guys around you when, um, when they're all playing ahead of you? And, um, it was probably the, the, in some ways, the worst moment for me that way, as far as I, I saw some parts of myself that I'd never really seen before in that, but it turned around within that season. And I had a couple of really good guys, uh, Kevin Nolan and Brad McElroy, two of my best friends on that team. And, um, it was, it was actually a lot of fun. And Sal Fasano, as a manager, was just every player's dream to, to play under. I had really good managers every year. Um, but he, um, was, he was compassionate but direct. Um, I grew a lot under him as far as just as a man but also as a player. And then uh, I hit the home run in one of the last games of the year. And it just kind of an evidence of really that. Like, I didn't have a very good year playing-wise, but... Um, but I hadn't given up and that was a big thing for me personally to, to be able to face something like that and to persevere through it, um, was a good challenge and a stretch for me, but it was, um, that again was a fun year because every ballpark you went to was just a little bit bigger and it was a little more serious and, uh, it was, it, it felt like a little more like the Bull Durham kind of a thing. Like the other one is, it's kind of what you expect 
minor league baseball, I feel like, but that felt a lot more professional. And until I got to Vancouver, um, which is just a step above, even, even though it's a step below organizationally, it's definitely, um, it's a sweet spot to play in. Um, Lansing felt like real baseball that was professional. It really felt like that. It had that feel where every every town, like we had the San Diego chicken come in and we got to do like a little skit with him and stuff. And then just that aspect of it um, was neat. So I, I, I love my time in Lansing um, in hindsight, but I really struggled there for a while uh, just with, with that Phantom DL. Uh, it was really bad, but again, it grew me. Okay, um, so 2010 comes to an end, and during the off offseason, uh, it's learned that uh, Vancouver is going to become a Toronto Blue Jays affiliate. Uh, now, I guess he obviously didn't know, I guess, at the time that maybe you'd be back in Vancouver, maybe you did, I don't know, but uh, what was your reaction to the news when you found out that the affiliation is going to switch over from Auburn to Vancouver? Yeah, it was really exciting. Um I'd been in Vancouver once, uh, just flying through. We played in a tournament out there with all the BC um, premier teams and uh, when I was up 16, I think. And so I'd only ever been to that part of the country once. But um, it was kind of that, like, <laughs> kind of that embarrassing hope of, like, you really want to make full season, but then you're like, you know what? If I don't make Lansing, it'd be really cool to play in Vancouver. <laughs> so... <laughs> Um, so I actually was, was excited about the opportunity and thought, really, I was going to go either way. Um, and the, the day the rosters were posted and I didn't make the cut to Lansing, um, it stunk because a guy who was going high A um, was pitching in an inter-squad game that, that day. And I think I had three at-bats against him and I had two home runs and a double or something off him. And he looked at me on, on the bench and he's like, I had no idea where to throw you. He's like, how did you not make Lansing at least? And uh, I don't know, man, I have no idea. But um, but then figuring out that what that meant was uh, I was going to get to go to Vancouver was definitely a silver lining in that cloud. And so, yeah, I didn't know originally when I found out that, that I, would, I was thinking Lansing the whole time. Um, but when I made peace with that roster spot, I was like, this is going to be exciting. Like, like for, for Vancouver to have this team and to be a Blue Jay affiliate and to get up um, and be the only minor league team in a whole nation. And in a town that really is a triple-A slash major league town, I don't know if I'm offending anybody by saying it's triple-A, but as far as it goes in baseball, like, sure, it's way above short season as far as the kind of town that it is and uh, city that it is, right? And um, and so I know my family was excited to hear about it um, and that opportunity. Uh, I was, I just knew how good of a thing it would be for Canadian baseball in general. And being a guy who played Team Ontario and played grassroots baseball, um, just a little more of an impact that way, knowing this is going to make a real difference for kids growing up, actually, like in the, in the BC area, but across the country, just to know that there is this team and to be able to follow it, um, will be really exciting and we'll do a lot for the Blue Jays. And so, um, also kind of just thinking about that and thinking, I bet you they're going to send a pretty good team up there. Uh, and they may send some guys there that they, they might hold a couple guys from Lansing or send some guys up from, from field a little early if it, if it goes well. Um, so when you find out you're going to Vancouver, it was actually, it's exciting. And, um, and again, like for somebody who was going to Lansing, it, it, it's pretty, it's something to say that you're still excited to go to short season. Okay, um, so I, the fact you got to uh, play, I think at one point there were six Canadian-born players on that 2011 team. Uh, I mean, it's pretty special to be a Canadian on a Canadian club, but how much more special was it to get to spend it with your fellow Canadians? Yeah, there's a, I think there's a really neat picture somewhere. I'm not sure. Uh, I think I have a copy of it in some place, but we're all uh, we're in a hockey pose, so a couple guys are stacking the pads. And, uh, we're all bent over with our bats as if we're playing hockey. And just that, uh, just the fanfare of that, the excitement of that, just the conversation that surrounded it, um, uh, really was fun. I, I really liked that aspect of it. And, um, and just feeling like when you go to college in the States and you play baseball professionally, you're kind of, a, I mean, even playing baseball in Toronto growing up, um, I was kind of always get fun of because I didn't play hockey. And so you never quite fit in. And you go to the States and you're the, you're the foreigner and you're on a visa and all that stuff. And then you get to come home. And like when we were going across the border, like you're the Canadian walking home. Um, 
really was neat. I think I think I really compare it, and especially because the name of the team. Uh, like when I played for Team Canada, that such a pivotal moment in my life to put that jersey on and see your country's name across your chest and think, like I am one of the best thirty players in the whole nation, and I'm representing my country. And then to do the and, and it felt the same way. Like I know there's an S on the end of the name, but at the same point, like to put Canadians on and like on July first to wear a Team Canada jersey, like or like a Canada Day jersey, and to hear your own anthem played because of it, it just it, it, it it's a little bit unexplainable, but um, it brings a joy, and uh, and not to need the whole season to learn the Canadian anthem to sing it <laughs> was pretty cool too. So, yeah, uh, and the guys, uh, I mean, those guys, the Canadian guys, and all the guys on that team, honestly, that was a pretty special team as far as personalities go. Um, you had some big-name guys like Syndergaard and uh, Nicolino and, and a couple guys in the bigs, too. I mean, Burns and uh, Pilar and Birdie played uh, I think last year and two years ago. Um, there's so many guys that are on that team, but, but every guy that rolled through there was just, Solid dude, and and when you talk to baseball guys, and I'm sure you talk to a lot of them, like when they talk to each other, you don't hear like you don't talk about like, hey, Randy Schwartz, hey, he played with them in Vancouver. What's he like? You never hear what kind of player he was. You don't, and you never hear like what he was good at on the field. You always hear it's just one, it's one of two answers. Because that guy was a good dude. He wasn't, and that's that's it. Like that's how you're known because you spend every day with these guys. You're the entertainment on the on the holidays. You don't get days. You get a day off every couple months. Like. You live life with these guys, and um, and so the again the Canadian guys themselves, just for all of us to, to be able to walk out of that field uh, at our own soil um, was something pretty special, and to do it together, and then uh, but all the guys on that team, I mean, no matter where they're from, I mean, guys like Dabi Nofuemi or uh, who's just the dude, I love that guy. I thought he's still playing. I just looked him up the other day, and uh, he's playing in Mexico, which he just hats off to him. Um, but but it was there were characters on that team like caricatures sorry like you just had like typical guys like Steve McQuail, uh who was the who was the guy from New York and, and he was just he was a stereotypical dude but fun I mean just every guy was for each other and uh, and that so made that team really special and Snyder had so much to do with that too. John Schneider, yeah. Um, I, are, are you still good for time? I'm not. Ta- I'm not keeping you from anything. No, you're. Good. Okay. Okay. Good. I just want to make sure we're, we're cool. But yeah, I got a few more questions to ask you. But this is great stuff. Thanks. Uh, thanks again, Randy. Um, yeah. what, I, what I wanted to ask you next was, uh, you know, you mentioned, uh, you know, getting to play on Canada Day, and the fact you got to, you homered on Canada Day. You homered also the day before, um, so you kind of had some Canada Day fireworks. What do you remember about those games? Yeah, that was a huge moment. Uh, I, I chalked that up there with um, when I played for Team Canada. We beat. Team USA for nothing, which was pretty symbolic on July 4th. <laughs> so that's kind of my like bad guy, wear the black uniform kind of big moment. And then to be the good guys and wear the white uniforms on Canada Day with the Canadians and, and hit a home run, um, that was pretty special. It was a pretty big deal. And again, like just to wear the jersey, to, to, to have a, because you never think of it, because right? there wasn't even a minor league team that was in, in Canada. So you never think that you're going to wear a special jersey for it. You're always having to celebrate all the American holidays. And uh, and now I fully embrace it. But then it was still that chip on your shoulder, right? And so, um, so man, I was so much fun. And, and that place, like that Bailey Stadium and the people of Vancouver were just, I mean, beautiful, like really beautiful. It was It was amazing. The, to, to have a place filled at that low of a level of baseball and to just feel like the whole city is really for you um, was tremendous. And so Canada Day itself, I remember just like I mean, roaring, like deafening sounds from the crowds. And so to hit a home run on Canada Day as a Canadian guy and hear the whole crowd go nuts, and a lot of them knew too to, that you are a Canadian guy, I mean, just... Yeah, that's one of the probably that, and and there's a game on July 14th, which uh, I saw you emailed about too, so I'm sure we'll talk about it a little bit. But um, those are probably the, the two best games of my professional career, and that's I know it doesn't seem like it's saying much because if you look at my stat lines, they're not that impressive. But, um, but as far as big moments, I mean, you just you soak that in, and that's why you play the game. It's it's that that atmosphere and that fun. I mean. I'm, I'm a guy who never really made it in other people's eyes, but um, wouldn't would, would look at 
moments like that and go, it, it was totally worth it. And, and, and yeah, I'd love to be a 10 year, 15 year big leaguer talking about this too. And that's why, you know, you get into pro baseball, but, um, when you look back on it and guys who win championships and talk about looking back on it, it's those kind of moments and those kind of times and then guys that you're with. Like if I, people ask me sometimes that I miss baseball at all. And really, I don't, I don't miss playing the game as much as I miss that day-to-day grind where you grew tight with a bunch of guys and you um, were there for one another and you had each other's back and, um, and you celebrated each other. And that was one thing that was always important to me. I remember... Um, Kevin Aarons was a third baseman in the program, and he was ahead of me a little bit. I think he was a year or two younger than me, but he had been in the um, Jays system for a while. And I remember it was a couple days before before the rosters were going to be posted, and uh, and he was going. He ended up going into Neiman, and we were taking ground balls together. And I remember noticing that he had his hands kind of back in his in his legs, and, and so that's going to be harder for you to feel the ball. And he had been struggling on the field. And I remember I just pulled him aside. I said, hey, Kev, I said, I know your hands are back a little bit. Just, you might want to drop your hands up forward. And he looked at me so weird. And I said, what's wrong? And he said, why would you tell me that? Like, you're fighting for the same spot I'm fighting for. Right. And I'm just thinking, I said, I said look, if you, if you, if I can't beat you out of that spot at your best, then I don't deserve it. And you do. And I want you to be better, too. Like, this isn't, there, there are things that are bigger than what roster I make. And uh, and so that again, the, the days like uh, Canada Day and, and June thirtieth ahead of that, um, just even playing in Vancouver, just the whole season. I mean, that is the, for sure. I part part of my professional career, but but most likely, I, I would say it's for sure the best season. Um, and it's definitely not the best season I ever had on the field as far as um, how my performance. But it was. It, it was just a beautiful. It was an amazing year. It was a fun year, um, and and again, it was it was just what you what you hoped that baseball would be like for all to play and for you when you grow up. All right, so you get through uh, Canada Day and all that, but uh, you you touched upon it earlier. Your biggest day as a pro: two home runs and a triple against Boise. Um, what do you remember about that day? Did you? I don't know. Did you make sure you have extra Wheaties for breakfast? How did, how did that all uh, come about for you that day in Boise? I, so since when I was at High Point in college and, and Team Ontario and growing up, I think the one thing that if I look back on, like a regret that I may have had about baseball was the kind of hitter that I was. I tried to not, I tried to be who I looked like when I got to the pros because I thought that's what was expected. So I thought I had to hit home runs. I had to be that guy. And so I wasn't. And I had never been that hitter. And I'd always, always used all fields and not at any level like this guy, but, but in the style of hitter, like a John Allrood versus, you know, whoever, like a Mark McGuire or whatever. Like I, I was never that big power guy. I'd always just been a really good hitter. And so you look at my strikeout totals and stuff, and, and that's not reflected because I was trying so hard to be the big guy. And, uh, and so in July, for the July 14th game, I remember just, I had been really connecting some dots in the cages um, and working on some stuff and really just felt exactly, I, I really do remember feeling exactly like I did in Auburn that first year where the Seapo, uh, Charlie Poe, the hitting coach, I just felt loose. I felt fun. I felt dialed in. And so the, the day didn't seem like anything different. But I knew that I, that I was I was good. I was kind of grooving, and uh, so I remember the first at bat, he uh, he went pretty far away on a pitch, and I got extended on it, and I thought I was going to hit the wall, and so I was booking it out of the gate, and uh, and it happened over the fence, and I couldn't believe it actually, because to go dead center at Nat Bailey is not that easy with that wall. And, uh, and so it was just exciting. So then the next at bat, I remember, um, he, I figured he would try to come hard in. And so sure enough, he did pretty early in the count and, uh, and I was waiting on it. So I got my hands through quick, quick and clear and kept it fair and, uh, and hit the second one, uh, back to back there. And, uh, and so just an amazing feeling. And then, uh, the, I think it was a third of that. 
the same kind of thing. I battled him a little bit, and I was a different pitcher, and he went away hard on me again, and then came away with some soft stuff, and I got extended on it. And then, uh, really, it was a triple, but the guy in center field kind of misplayed the wall because there's no way with my speed that I ever would have got a, a for sure legit triple. So I'm going to take it. It's, <laughs> it's probably the only one I'll ever get again. But uh, but the the best thing about the whole thing was my now wife, who was my fiance at the time, had never really seen me play an actual game. And she flew up, and that was her first game there. Oh, nice. And she was in the crowd sitting next to my host parents and saw that game. And so, like, uh, it, it's a pretty big moment for us that way where she remembers me as a baseball player. Um, we met when I was in uh, spring training the year before, while well, the year I went to Lansing. And so we were dating that year, and then we were engaged the year I was in Vancouver. And um, and so for her to get to see that, and then to do the post-game interview, and, and I think Rob Say had known that she was there, so that was put as part of the interview, and give a little shout-out there, um, was an awesome moment too because it just you know I had my parents listen to the uh, live cast uh, back in Ontario. I had my fiance there, uh, and again like you're on your own home soil. It was it was pretty special. So yeah, that was a surreal day. I remember about every pitch of, of those at bats, and I usually don't. So I must have been really locked in because if I can remember the pitches, uh, whatever it is, nine years later. Um, I must have really been picking it up well that day. And I just like felt for probably the last time I felt pretty invincible uh, that day. Everything was really working well. Okay. As for the season itself, it was a roller coaster ride. You guys nearly got a first half playoff berth. It went down to the very final day um, in the second half that you managed to uh, squeeze in and, uh, uh, I spoke with Brian Longfrey uh, about a week and a half ago, and he shared some video with me. You guys are on the bus waiting on that score from the Everett-Spokane game, and Everett lost, so that's why you guys were able to get in. Uh, talk about what you remember from that season, because it was really a, a, quite a roller coaster ride. Yeah, uh, it, we, we kind of had started out with um, such good guys, and we kind of knew, or at least those of us who had some awareness, knew that we weren't going to be able to keep those guys should it be here. And, uh, and so knowing in that first half that, um, that if we didn't win this playoff spot, it was going to be a little tougher in the second half, um, was kind of in the back of some of our minds at least. But, um, but when we got the news that, uh, we hadn't made the first, um, the first half spot, it, really the team responded in such a, in such an amazing way that you just kind of like, I remember multiple moments in the playoffs and just beforehand, like kind of thinking, it just like I don't know, how to, I think we're going to win this. Like, like it just kind of feels like we're like I don't know how we wouldn't. And like, and then you kind of get that nervous feeling, like you're not. And then something goes really well, and the, and it would keep happening like that. But but the attitudes of each guy were like, so what? Like, so what? We didn't make this. We're going to make this second one, and and like and that that'll be how we do it. And so we, it was almost like this this destined thing that we felt was going to happen, but nobody could explain why they felt that way, but we all just kind of had that attitude towards it. And, uh, and so rallied around each other to get there. And, um, and for me personally, I just kind of had become more in that second half. Once uh, Patterson showed up, uh, I was, who was a really good dude, by the way, one of my better friends on that team. Like I just kind of became a role playing guy at that point. Um, and, and really, played behind him and Flynn Mayor and a couple other guys, uh, Andy Burns. And so, um, so I got to be kind of a morale guy for that and, and keep guiding guys through. And, and probably that was my better part of the role. And maybe a lot of the reason why I was sent there, um, besides being Canadian was that, um, I was one of the older guys and could help navigate this with some younger guys. I know for sure that year in spring training, I was put with Dalton Pompey, which I'm not sure if you're familiar. He's kind of a back and forth guy with the Jays and, Triple A kind of guy, but um, but he was like a young Canadian guy and just was signed the year before. And so I was they put me as his roommate to kind of groom him, kind of the uh, the Kevin Costner's um, role to New Kalush a little bit. <laughs> and, uh, and and so the same thing on this team. And I think it wasn't that hard of a job to do, really. Like like I, I never I was never told directly that it was my job to do that, and I never felt like the minutes like the Snides or anybody felt like I was supposed to do that or never communicated it. To me, as if I was, but uh, but I kind of felt that I felt like, man, if we win, 
if you're not seeing this or whatever, I'm gonna I'm gonna step in and help with this. And um, and honestly, didn't really have to. <laughs> the yeah. Guys just wanted it so bad, and and really for for multiple reasons, everyone's out there for their own for their own professional career and whatever. But but at the same point, um, there really was a team sense in that, and that you don't always get that in minor league baseball. You, you definitely get it at about every other step. But it's hit and miss sometimes in Pro Bowl where it, it, it is themselves, you know, and, and kind of compare it. Some guys could care less about, and, and that's unfortunate. But um, that's not what Vancouver Cooper was like at all. And so I think that that was the major reason why. I mean, besides a really good bullpen and uh, some good arms in the starting thing, too, just that, that's, I think, the it's that, that, made, that makes every team special. It's a championship team, but made that team special for sure. Okay, so you end the season um, and you go head into the playoffs. And I think one of the most amazing things I thought about that run was the fact you ended the regular season in Boise, find out you get in the playoffs, you have to come back to Vancouver to play game one, and then as it turns out, games two and three in Eugene, a whole lot of travel and a whole short period of time. How did you guys manage to battle through that and make it to uh, the Northwest League Finals? Yeah, um, Boise is, I, I still say it's one of the prettiest cities I've ever been to, but it needs to move somewhere else. It's just <laughs> terrible to get to, and you just are driving. It, it, I played a summer in Saskatchewan uh, in Melville, and I, and I had a really good year there, and it was fun, but it, the thing that's fun about that is you fell asleep on the bus, and you woke up, and you had no idea if you had been asleep for 30 seconds or, tw- or 20 minutes, because there was a grain elevator, and fields and it was flat and there was no water and it was the same everywhere and so Boise the trip there was like that you just went through this desert basically and you kept going uphill until you finally showed up to like the Emerald City and you felt like the Wizard of Oz was waiting in the center and uh, and so that trip <laughs> yeah that trip was terrible but uh, but then to come back I, I don't think besides that actual trip like that literal bus ride I just think we were so laser focused in on where we were heading that none of us really uh, ever talked like we felt that. And, and, the, and the travel didn't feel like much. I was like, I don't, maybe other guys have a different experience, but for me, I never really felt that. Um, again, besides the actual literal hours driving to and from Boise, it was like whatever it was, like 13 hours or something crazy. Um, and it was just like, they should be part of a different league. <laughs> this is too far. So, um, so yeah, so the, so the playoff run again was a little bit surreal. Of like, there were these moments where you kind of felt like it was hanging in the balance, but then uh, we would pull through, and uh, guys like like Jesse Hernandez and guys like that would just have awesome outings and would just fight and pull. The, I mean, him specifically. I remember he was just him and uh, who was a closer, Permison, Drew Permison, who just, I mean, bulldog fighters and the kind of guys that you you will you would go to war with um, because of the way they battle on the mound. And so you were always there for them. And and those kind of guys we had on the mound right throughout. And I think really, like, I, I have to look back at box scores to, to know the answer to this anyway, but, but from my experience, it was those guys that really drove us through. It was the pitching that really carried us through. And the hitters did their job and, and um, guys played roles and did really well. But but really, the, the attitudes of the guys on the mound were like, "You will not take the ball from me, and I will not quit." And uh, to have a to have a whole bullpen full of guys like that is, is something pretty special. Well, I, I'm sure probably a lot of people may have counted you out in 2011. You get into the playoffs, lose Game One in Vancouver, but bounce back to take Games Two and Three in Eugene, and then you have to go to Tri City, and apparently there's this article that I heard about that uh, Tri City. Uh, this writer basically said, "What was the point in even playing this series? That Tri City should win it easily." I mean, you guys had chances to, uh, you know, uh, pack it in, but you didn't. Right? Yeah, I don't think um, I don't think we ever read that article. <laughs> <laughs> I just I, again, I, I think that was never never a mindset. Um, the, the thing too that I, I don't know that we talked about or not, but but I knew to be true is like like teams change so much through a year anyway that like any any kind of history or any kind of battle is a little different in the minor leagues than it might be in college or it might be in 
um, the things where you, you're kind of facing a different team by the time you get to the end of the year. And so you don't really, you don't really look at the, I mean, you do scouting reports and you think about guys and what they're likely to do that, you know, and whatever, but like you just focus on the ball and, and you're, you're playing, you're just playing a bunch of nameless guys in some sense, because it, it's not this team that, that's intimidating. So, um, as long as you have that attitude towards it, I think, um, I think that's, I, I've coached a little bit down here in Florida and, uh, just social media baseball is so strange because I got guys in high school that know everything about the guy we're going to face on Friday. And, and until we got to like college and most likely pro ball, you really didn't know that. Like you didn't, you didn't have any idea who these guys were. You might have seen their name on a stat line. They weren't intimidating to you. You didn't really know them. They weren't like, you don't care how many offers they had from anywhere in high school or whatever. And so I think we, I mean, 2011 is kind of the turning, you know, it's in that turning era of that where um, now we're definitely fully immersed in it. And then it was really the beginnings of it. And so, um, so again, you know, I think we didn't really read the press clippings, at least I didn't. And, um, and then that September 11th game, that championship game, I mean, we just, there was some nerves in the first couple innings, but then uh, we put up a five spot in the seventh, and just it was surreal. I'm like we got, kind of got this in the bag. Like we just got to finish this out. And so, what a with a difficult up and down season, what a fun way to end three innings of baseball, where you score five in the seventh, and then it just I mean you just run through it, and there's that nervous excitement of like this could all totally go wrong, and they could put up a big crooked number on us here. But all we got to do is do our job and finish this. And uh, and then for me, I uh, defensively substituted in for Patterson in the ninth. And uh, and so to get to be on the field for the big moment, I remember when um, when the first two guys, I think the first two guys struck out. And I should, again, I could look at the box score maybe, but I'm pretty sure they did. And uh, that it just it felt like a movie, you know, like like the guys that strike out in the last little bit, and it's like the big. I don't know, little big league or some movie like that, right? And uh, and then the ground ball at the middle to end it, and just a huge celebration was just, I mean, it was picture perfect. And and again with a team that had not been totally on point all year and had some ups and downs, and, and like short, just nearly missed the first half uh, playoff spot. Uh, it, it it really it, it's kind of like the saying, and this isn't new to me or anything, but. But every team that wins championships battles some kind of big adversity throughout the year. And, and it may be cumulatively big, it might be little battles the whole way, or it might be one major thing. And uh, and that team was strong because they had battled through some stuff. And, um, and the celebration in the locker room was just so fun and so free because we had, we had really worked hard and earned it. And, um, and again... I, I got the. I almost felt like part of the almost guilty for getting the ring because I had been such a little part of the on-field um, victories in the playoffs. But that's not how it ever actually felt in the moment. That's not how any of the guys felt. Uh, every every guy in that team, every guy who had left that team um, and had started with us was important and um, made us who we are in that. So um, just what a good memory to look back on and see that, that that's what the baseball should be about. Is it hard to believe uh, it's been almost 10 years uh, since you celebrated? Yeah. I mean, to get an email from you and, and be like, I have a baseball interview. Uh, I haven't talked about baseball with anybody in, I don't know how many years. So yeah, I mean, nine years now, this season will be nine years. So almost 10. Um, I'm a dad with two kids and teach full time in Florida and, um, just very different. So to look back on it, it's been kind of fun. Um, and it's, it, it is, it's, it's in one sense, it's a lifetime ago for me because I was already an older guy and that was my last year. But in another sense, like, uh, I, even talking to you about it, I still feel, um, the excitement of that year. I still feel, uh, the camaraderie of that team. I still feel, uh, all the things that, um, that we experienced in that year just come true again and they're easily tapped into. And so, uh, it's not, uh, I've never been one to be, um, you know, the glory days song kind of a guy kind of sitting there and reminiscing on it. But, um, I got a big fat championship ring that I can look into every once in a while and just smile at the, the fun of it. 
and um, and what a good memory and again like in, in a way that could have been and for a lot of guys a season like I had and, and a career like I had professionally could be a very bitter moment for them but um, knowing that it was exactly what um, what was made for me to get me to be the man that I am and uh, and that development and the relationships that were built and uh, and, and just again, getting to be part of something like that uh, was so special. Final question: Do you still uh, keep in touch with any of your former teammates uh, in 2011? So not really. Um, I just kind of a weird thing about being a Canadian and being mostly stationed in the states. I had a, like a temporary American phone and never had a cell phone in Canada. And then uh, when I got released slash retired, um, changed phone plans and all that kind of stuff. And then I had a weird thing in Lansing where there was a kind of a super fan kind of guy and, and kind of some scary stalking-ish kind of stuff. And so I just got off of social media stuff for a while. And so now it's at the point where it's so much later that honestly, not really just lost touch with them. So, um, so I've, I've, I've never been, which is weird to say, I've never really been much of a sports fan. I don't really follow a team. I loved the Blue Jays as a kid. I love teams. I love sports. Uh, I could watch anything and enjoy it, but, um, but you never really have the time. And when you're playing, you don't have the time to follow it either. But, um, but I always track guys that I played with. And so I'm always looking up and seeing how they're doing. Um, a couple of guys I played with were uh, one guy was at my wedding and uh, a couple of guys I was around there too. And so every once in a while, I, I just kind of have the idea of driving off to Tampa and going over to Dunedin during spring training and just seeing if there's anybody around. And to the point where there's not that many guys left um, that I knew. A lot of guys that I knew uh, seemed to be 2015, the year that a lot of guys got out, or their last year. But um, but something like Snides and, and all of them, it'd be fun to go back and look into. The people I keep in touch with more so are um, are the host families that we stayed with and, and the families you kind of run into. Um, I stayed with a family there, and the, and the boy went to Ontario and uh, to school, and so we kept in touch. And actually, the... Um, the mom had flown down here for a conference in Disney, and so we went out to lunch with her and, and got to spend some time. So really, more of those relationships lasted for me, um, just because it was just a weird situation where I, I kind of lost contact because I didn't have contact uh, information at the time. So, so yeah, unfortunately, no. Um, but been just kind of cheering them on from a distance and, and watching their careers uh go and, and that's been pretty fun it's fun to see a, t- a game on TV and be like I play with that guy in Vancouver yeah. <laughs> and especially a guy like, a guy like Syndergaard or whatever where you're like this guy's like super famous and he's and it's like he was actually the very first this is a funny story he was the first guy I ever faced um, in an inner squad game after I signed my contract no idea who the kid was <laughs> never seen him before and I hadn't played like so Barry was my last time I played and then I, got, I went back in student top for the whole fall. I had the tryout in October of 2008. And then my first game was like April of 2009. I hadn't seen live pitching until then. So the first day that I suit up, I get in the box and there's this tall right-handed kid and a young kid. And I'm, so I step in and, uh, and I watch him warm up a little bit. I get my timing. I think I was the first batter in the inning. And I step in and the first... The first fastball comes through, and I just kind of watch it and time it. It's like, <laughs> yeah. and I was like, oh, it looks pretty hard. But I'm, but I'm sure it's rusty, and it's not really that hard. It's probably like 93. It's not that bad. So I step back in, and I remember about two pitches later, I tried to pull something, but I hit it right down the right field line. <laughs> and so my, my eyes went to left as the ball went to right because I didn't know where it went. Yeah. And so I stepped out of the box, and, and I went back to behind the cage, and I said, how hard was he throwing anything? Oh, that was 98. <laughs> oh, my God. <laughs> like, okay, I guess I'm not that rusty. Yeah. So, uh, so, yeah, so he's, a, he's a good kid. He's a funny kid. Uh, Randy, that, that was awesome. Thank you so much for taking this time. I, I think it's almost been an hour already, but thanks so much for your time. Really appreciate it. And uh, um, all the best to you and yours, and stay safe. <laughs> Thank you. If you see Rob say, let him know we say hi from Florida. Will do. Will do.